What would you answer if someone asked you, which is more deadly to humans, a shark or a cow? The shark seems the obvious choice, but why? It's because of the availability heuristic. In our minds, we don't know the answer exactly, so we change the question and look for information we can easily recall. We rely on the fact that the easier the recall, the more probable the result must be. And this availability heuristic leads us to be biased. We make a decision based on our personal experiences or vivid examples rather than based on the statistics. For example, reading about a crime in a newspaper makes you feel uneasy about going out in public. Or, after you read case studies of successful businesses, you may judge the probability of running a successful business to be greater even though 90% of startups fail. So, you're not really answering the question as it is, you're changing the question. Instead of estimating the frequency, you report back with an impression of the ease with which instances came to mind. Let's go back to the shark and the cow. Without knowing the answer, we think of the option that sticks out more in our minds. Maybe you've seen shark attacks on the news, or maybe you remember seeing Sharknado. But sharks definitely stand out as being deadly. Cows, on the other hand, are docile. They just hang out in a field and they moo. They aren't vicious killers. So the easy answer it must be the shark. But that would be wrong. In reality, cows are responsible for killing far more people than sharks. Between 2001 and 2013, on average, 20 people per year were killed by cows, while sharks killed an average of one person per year. So the next time you're in a field with a cow, you better watch your back. Now you may say, okay, that's such a specific example, and there's no way you'd ever fall for that again. But odds are, you already have. When couples were asked to self-assess and give percentages of how much they've contributed to household chores, not too shockingly, the percentages given added up to more than 100%. Both spouses remember their own efforts and contributions much more clearly than those of the other. The difference in availability of information leads to a difference in judged frequency. Now let's apply this example to a group project. Maybe you and your teammates feel like each of you have put in more than your fair share of work on the project, which is causing everyone to feel like they're not being appreciated for the extra work they're putting in. For example, I know I have done most of the work in this project. What is happening here? You're using System 1, and these decisions are based on how easily System 1 can retrieve information and the amount of information it can find. The experiment implemented by Norbert Schwarz with other German psychologists explain how System 1 affects people's impressions. In that study, he asked different questions to two groups. The first, list six instances in which you behaved assertively. The second was asked to list 12 instances. Then they were asked to evaluate themselves on how assertive they felt they were. As a result, the first group rated themselves higher on assertiveness than the second group. Now let's say you were in a job interview and you were asked to list 12 times that you were a successful leader. A few examples may come to mind quickly, but then it starts getting harder. Studies show that not being able to come up with all 12 makes people question whether they really are a successful leader. People think that if they are having so much trouble coming up with examples, then they must not have that attribute. This is an example of unexplained unavailability heuristic. This happens when people are surprised that they can't come up with enough examples. So how do you resist the availability heuristic? The answer is awareness. Awareness is key. Studies show that when a subject in any way knows they may be relying on availability, they cease to be affected by it. Awareness removes the surprise factor and counteracts the effects. On a routine basis, we need to consider the actual odds of something occurring. If not, we will use off-the-cuff instincts and rely on the recollection of System 1. This leads us to miscalculate the probability of an event. So remember, the key to avoiding availability bias is to use actual statistical odds as opposed to intuition when attempting to determine the likelihood of an event. You must make the effort to reconsider your impressions and intuitions and ask yourself, did I really do more work in the group project or am I not considering everyone else's contribution? While trying to be vigilant against all availability biases is very difficult, it's worth putting in the effort to try. Availability can also have strong effects on a large scale. 
Sensational news stories take over, and suddenly, everyone is talking about it. Last year, the media tried to tell us it was the summer of the shark. Summer of the shark. The summer of the shark. The summer of the shark. But they were just trying to scare us to boost their ratings. So what's the real deal? Miami Seaquarium shark expert Chris Plant set the record straight. Is this the summer of the shark? No. Shouldn't we be scared of these sharks? No. Really, to put, to put it into perspective, more people are killed each year by falling coconuts than sharks. Excuse me, wait, what's that? Did you say coconuts? More coconuts kill people each year than sharks do. These stories can lead to public panic and even new laws and regulations. Anyone remember Y2K? Seems like nothing now, but in the late 1990s, many feared for the worst. It all began when it was found that our very computers may contain a glitch that would bring about the end of the world. See, when computer programmers created software, they used a two-digit representation of the year instead of four. So the year would show 99 rather than 1999. But as the year changed from 1999 to 2000, the computer would turn to 00. zero. It would then be unable to recognize whether the date was 1900 or 2000. The Y2K story was quickly circulated by the news media. By January of 1999, the cover of Time magazine read, The End of the World. The overwhelming message was, life as we know it will soon come to an end. Fears arose as people began to believe that the current technology would be destroyed and we would all be forced into a new low-tech age. Stock markets will crash, nuclear missiles will be fired, total chaos. So what happened? In 1998, the United States government passed the Year 2000 Information and Readiness Disclosure Act in order to prevent the havoc from the computer software problems. An international Y2K cooperation center was established and joined by more than 120 countries. This global cooperation set about to discuss ways to minimize adverse Y2K effects. Insurance companies created and sold insurance plans exploiting the potential negative effects of Y2K. And the total cost for all this preparation? A whopping $413 billion. And what did we get? As the new year rang in across the world and a new millennium finally arrived, you may have already guessed, nothing serious happened. While some minor problems arose, there were no massive malfunctions, and for most, no effect at all. These stories need not be the most important news, but that doesn't matter. Why? Because our judgments are subject to an availability cascade. These cascades start a chain reaction that turns small events into big problems. At the heart of these events are the availability entrepreneurs, or in this case, the media. They are the creators of the stories and often exaggerate the dangers in order to attract attention. These entrepreneurs inspire an emotional reaction which cause an event to come to mind much easier than issues which do not. The result? Public panic and government action. And governments from around the world have been forced to succumb to the will of availability cascades. In 2008, South Korea experienced a case of bad beef. This is remembered as one of the biggest and worst protests in South Korea's history. About 80,000 demonstrators gathered in central Seoul on Tuesday evening. Demonstrations began after Korean government officials decided to reverse a ban on U.S. beef imports. The ban was put in place in 2003 after scares of mad cow disease was detected in U.S. beef cattle. Soon after the ban was lifted, Korean news and social media began to report the risks associated with mad cow disease and criticized the Korean president for recklessly putting his people at risk. The country's most popular broadcast channel, MBC, published a story aptly named, Is American Beef Really Safe from Mad Cow Disease? In response to the ensuing media frenzy, hundreds of thousands of people took to the streets in protest to put a stop to the importation. Under pressure, the prime minister and several cabinet members tendered their resignations. South Korea's entire cabinet has offered to resign to dampen public uproar over the resumption of U.S. beef imports. Now, eight years later, do Koreans still fear U.S. beef? Not at all. 
Restaurants and households across the country regularly purchase U.S. beef without fear. Soon after the scare, it was found that the news relating to the risk of mad cow disease was not true. This time, the government took action against the media company for its irresponsible reporting. And since then, no one has died from consuming U.S. beef. The reality behind the story, three cows had been diagnosed in the U.S. as having mad cow disease. And these cows never made it into the food system, so there was never any danger. It's been suggested that these cascades lead to a distortion of allocated public resources. By reacting to public panic and outcry instead of scientific fact, lawmakers are often forced to make bad choices. These cascades can also deeply affect the economy. In the 2008 financial crisis, we saw the housing and stock markets collapse, leaving many unemployed and homeless. Experts have studied the causes, and many believe it began from the lower interest rates policy. From 2000 to 2001, the Fed cut interest rates 11 times. And people began borrowing cheap money to purchase homes, triggering housing prices to rise. From 2002 to 2006, prices rose by 31.6%. These continuous increases caused everyone to overestimate the current state of the market because the housing market had always been thought of as stable. So at the time, no one could imagine its collapse. The belief that the housing market was a safe investment led experts to ignore the risks. So people just kept on borrowing. It seemed as though the increasing prices would last forever because no one saw a need for alarm until it was too late. Unfortunately, Many buyers could not afford their housing loans, and as default soared, prices plummeted. Giant banks like Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, and IndyMac declared bankruptcy, leading investors to panic. Reacting to the panic and the rapid economic decline, the U.S. government stepped in and spent $700 billion in tax money in order to bail out these big banks. And finally... Let's take a moment to think about Walt Disney. After he died in 1966, he was cryogenically frozen in hopes of being brought back to life at a future date. That's how it happened, right? Like dominoes, availability cascades trigger chain reactions that create the perception of increasing plausibility through the rise of availability in the social and public domain. Some stories pass from person to person and eventually the story becomes truth, or rather, an urban legend. These stories are folklore and usually contain some thrilling elements. They're told as though they've really happened, but most often they're complete fabrications. And many are still passed around today. Despite having technology that gives us access to actual data and information that proves them false, Many choose to believe the stories simply because of their availability. Believers then spread the word and create new believers until it becomes the stuff of legend. These urban legends are passed around globally too. In Japan, they have Kuchisake Ona, the slit mouth girl, a vengeful spirit who kills her victims with a pair of scissors. Or in Latin America, they have El Chupacabra, a blood-sucking creature that kills farm animals. These stories continue to be passed around today. So what really happened to Walt Disney? Turns out, he wasn't frozen after all. After he died, he was cremated. Or was he?